Ships are a core aspect of Star Citizen's gameplay, and their fancy trailers or one of Star Citizen's big annual events like IAE are probably why you back the game. But what ship is the right ship? Most of us start with humble beginnings, like the feisty Aurora MR or Mustang Alpha, but where do you go from there? Do you choose which ship looks the coolest, or do you take into consideration the task ahead? This is not meant to be a detailed combat guide for individual ships. If that's something you're interested in, let me know in the comments below. But rather, this video is meant to help you think critically about what ships you're using and how to use them best as a solo player or part of a group. We'll mainly be talking about PvP scenarios in this video, but what works for PvP will also work for PvE. Remember, if you find this guide useful, hit that like button, it really helps me out. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this one. Going all the way back to 2012, Chris Roberts has talked about how he enjoys rock, paper, scissors or RPS style elements in video games and that he wanted to bring this type of gameplay to Star Citizen and this isn't unusual for multiplayer video games. Game designers will often use RPS as a way to attempt to bring balance to their games and if you take a look at your collection of unplayed games on Steam you'll find a number that do just this, some less obvious than others. Trading card based games are popular for RPS and one of the most obvious examples is Pokemon where Pokemon's strengths and weaknesses are based on elemental types. Some Mario and Luigi games such as Superstar Saga and Bowser's Inside Story use a power triangle system based off of the game's three attack types, melee, ranged and flying. Doesn't that sound familiar? Even the Souls like games don't escape. Boss fights tend to break down into an attack, defense, economy strategy. Attack being the stabby stabby bit, defense being the roly roly bit, and economy being the bit where you take an action to support your character such as drinking a potion. Blizzard's World of Warcraft is an extremely complex example. The game is made up of roles, damage, tank, and healing, and those roles are made up of a number of classes with abilities. You use the abilities appropriate to the type of target you're attacking. But due to the complex nature of World of Warcraft, bringing balance to the game has been a constant source of headache for Blizzard, and the game from patch to patch develops new metas as a result. Historically, Star Citizen has had a fairly linear ship meta that favoured a small handful of ships, whether it's the Sabre, the Super Hornet or Vanguard Sentinel. Yes, these ships were once meta to the Blade, Gladius, or Talon. Meta will never entirely go away. People will naturally want to min-max and get the most combat performance out of their ship, and that's fine. But historically, the meta in Star Citizen has pigeonholed players into flying specific ships with specific weapons in a specific flight style. Things now thankfully are a little different. That's not to mean that there aren't meta ships, there definitely are. But right now, Star Citizen is probably in the best place it ever has been in terms of ship's diversity for PvP. When it comes to rock, paper, scissors and spaceships, what exactly does Chris mean? Well, just like the hand-based game, where one ship might be strong against another, it should also be weak against another. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. Before we do, I'd like to preface that these examples are with future physicalized armor and master mode changes in mind, and also in a 1v1 scenario where both pilots are of equal skill. For example, an Anvil F7CM Super Hornet may be strong against a Drake Buccaneer. After all, the F7CM is an armored medium fighter with a co-pilot controlled turret while the Buccaneer is a light fighter that's held together by the hopes and dreams of those that believe that CIG will one day give the Cutlass a bathroom. But what if the Super Hornet went up against an RSI Scorpius? The Scorpius is a more heavily shielded target than the Super Hornet and has considerably more firepower. Chances are it wouldn't stand a chance. How about something a little larger? 
The Hammerhead from Aegis is an armoured patrol ship with more turrets than you can shake a sausage at. In theory, it could go up against a wing of fighters, but thanks to its armour, those fighters would be ineffective. After all, we're heading towards a future where small calibre weapons won't be able to penetrate the armour of larger targets. But if fighters can't penetrate the armour, what can? The Perseus from RSI is a sub-capital hunter. It comes equipped with a size 7 turret and a number of size 5 torpedoes, which means the hammerhead would likely have an emotional rapid disassembly. I could keep giving theoretical examples, but I'd like to give a practical example from a recent stream. By the way, I stream daily on Twitch, make sure you enter the giveaway over there. Myself and my org visited a recent in-game event and blasted it to smithereens. No, it wasn't IAE, we did that the week previously. Jump Town, for those that don't know, is a regular event where players can fight for drugs to sell at an increased price. I'm going to redact the actual org name here, but in our example, the facility is being held by an org that we'll call the Salty Mike Hair Preservation Society. I'm flying with my org, the Blue Buckets, a group of degenerate low flyers who spend the majority of their time prospecting the rocks of Daymar using their faces. We need to scout the area, so let me introduce you to Sultan. He's not actually a Blue Bucket, he's more of a contractor that we've pulled in to assist. Sultan's in a Razor EX, a racing ship outfitted with <clears throat> signature reducing materials. Stealth is pretty scuffed right now in 321, but so is Radar, and the Razor is pretty quick, so it'll get the job done. The Razor was also chosen for another role, but we'll come back to that later. Sultan takes the Razor down and with one quick flyby, observes a number of ships. An Aegis Hammerhead patrol ship, an Aegis Redeemer gunship, and a number of light, medium, and heavy fighters. While we're aware of what ships are at the facility, our scout was unable to observe any ground vehicles or marines. As a general rule of thumb, we always bomb the ground using an A2 because we are such staunch believers in freedom and democracy and nothing screams freedom and democracy like a size 10 bomb. It's at this point I should introduce you to Rogue Wyvern. He's really old and cranky and old, but unlike the average A1 pilot, he can actually drop a bomb on a target. Sending in our A2 first would make it an obvious target, so this is where our fighter wing comes in. I'm flying an Aegis Gladius, a light fighter, and my wingman is coasting flying an F8C, a heavy fighter, and the best ship in the game for running away. We have a second fighter team comprised of Zalrin in an Anvil Arrow and Lauren in a Crusader Ares Inferno. We'll talk more about these ships shortly. Our third team is comprised of Redrolled in an Anvil Hawk, a small fighter with an EMP device, great for knocking ships offline after they've lost their shields. We also have G.I. Jew in an Esperia Talon, yes, that G.I. Jew from CitizenCon. Finally, we have Jimmy. No, not that Jimmy, this Jimmy. Jimmy has been a friend of mine for a number of years, and today he'll be flying the Aegis Eclipse, like a true Frenchman. The Aegis Eclipse is a stealth bomber capable of carrying three size 9 torpedoes. At this point, you might be wondering why we ourselves have chosen not to bring a Hammerhead or a Redeemer, a Hurricane or a Scorpius. Right now, I place these ships in the Area of Denial category. The Hurricane and Scorpius can be helpful here, but they're two-seater ships, and I'd rather have more numbers cluttering the radar to hide our A2 and Eclipse. As for the Hammerhead and Redeemer, they're great at defending areas, but not great at chasing once the fight moves away from the area. This, however, will likely change with Master Modes. As we approach Jump Town with our fighter wing, our plan is to stay out of the gun ranges of the Hammerhead and Redeemer and engage their fighters. However, while we're staying out of gun range, we will periodically fire missiles at the Hammerhead. I'll explain why we do this later. 
Rogue in the A2 will follow our fighter wing about 30 seconds later, with Jimmy in the Eclipse following behind. Myself and Coastin begin engaging an F8C, and its shields are quickly shredded and it starts to run. This is where we come back to Sultan in the Razor LX. We didn't just bring it to scout, it's one of the few ships that's actually faster than the F8C. Myself and Coastin break off to engage another target as not to waste time, and Sultan pursues the F8C. When in larger group engagements like this, it's often not worth chasing targets, but better to swap to a target that's a higher threat, whether it be to yourself or others in your group. At this point, Zelrin in the Arrow and Lorin in the Ares Inferno engage the Redeemer. This group have been chosen specifically. The Arrow is fantastic in atmosphere and can help draw fire away from Lorin, and the Inferno has a size 7 ballistic Gatling gun. This ship is literally designed to chew through larger, slower ships like the Redeemer, but at the same time, it's vulnerable to fighters. Rogue in the A2 has now closed in on Jumptown, and the bomb is away. Oh, I, I literally will turn to say, oh my, look at all the bombs. Those are all bombs, all those triangles. As soon as the bomb blows, the jig is up, and the enemy are aware that there's an A2 on the field. As a result, I send Red Rolled in the Hawk and G.I. Jew in the Talon to support the A2. Rather than run, however, Rogue turns the A2 towards the Redeemer and assists Zelrin and Lauren with its ADB ballistic Gatling guns. Remember earlier I mentioned that our fighters would occasionally be firing missiles at the Hammerhead? You're probably wondering why. Well, here comes Jimmy, everyone, with his massive size 9 torpedo. Continuously firing small missiles at large targets often leads to their pilots becoming complacent and can mask a torpedo's approach. Jimmy fires the torpedo at its minimum range, which hits the target, destroying the hammerhead. Remember guys, torpedoes have a distinctive sound. If you hear the sound of sizzling bacon, prepare to evade, or just fly into the torpedo. Either works. Now we've cleared out the Redeemer and the Hammerhead, it's time to mop up the fighters. Sultan in the Razor LX forced the F8C that he was chasing to retreat and has rejoined the main fight. By this point, both Rogue in the A2 and Lauren in the Inferno have multiple fighters on them. I order both to retreat so they can rearm and Sultan replaces Lauren as Zelrin's wingman. All that's left on the field is an enemy Hornet, a Vanguard Sentinel, a Cutlass Blue, and a Gladius. When assessing a battlefield, knowledge of the game, its ships, weapon systems, and your ability to prioritize targets really comes into play. Who do you send and after which targets? Let's take a moment to think about what enemy ships are on the board, but also about what tools those ships have in their arsenal and how it compares to our fighters. The Cutlass Blue is a heavy fighter which uses a dampener to prevent anyone within 2 kilometers from quantum jumping away. It also has a manned anti-fighter turret. As it stands, we have more people on the field than the enemy and everyone is pretty safe for now, so I'm not too concerned about our ability to jump away. The Vanguard Sentinel has an anti-fighter turret and an EMP device, which will later be replaced with EMP missiles once they're in the game. This means that the Sentinel could shut down one of our ships if it gets a good hit with the EMP. EMPs have a maximum range, so when you see an EMP charging up, it's a big blue glowing ball. Back up and fight at range if your shield is down. EMPs can only stay charged for so long before they overheat. Once it does overheat, move back in. Something else to remember is that EMPs distortion damage falls off and gets weaker over range. The Hornet has a lot of firepower, but its main strength is its forward acceleration. It can get in close, unleash a lot of damage, and get back out before you even realize that they're there. The Gladius is one of the most maneuverable fighters in the game. While it doesn't have as much firepower as a ship like the Hornet, it can evade your shots and get behind you, but more importantly, it's good at chasing as well as merging onto a target and keeping its nose on that target. 
In this scenario, I would send Sultan in the Razor EX and Zelrin in the Arrow after the Gladius. The Razor LX can keep up and outmaneuver the Gladius. The Arrow has a slightly slower turn rate and top speed than the Gladius, but it can pull higher Gs. The Arrow also has a small profile when you're looking at it head on, which makes it hard to hit when its nose is on target. It also has a tight jerk profile, calm down ladies, which makes it quicker to aim at a pip than the Gladius. Jerk being how quickly your thrusters increase or decrease power. I'm going to send myself in the Gladius and coast in, in the F8C against the Vanguard Sentinel. The F8C can outmaneuver the Sentinel, however, if the Sentinel gets the forward facing shield of the F8C down, the EMP could be problematic. I'm in the Gladius, a light fighter, and can easily outfly the Sentinel, however, I do need to watch out for that turret. The Gladius also comes with two size 1 shields, which makes tanking the EMP hit a little bit easier. I send Red Rolled in the Hawk and G.I. Jew in the Talon against the Hornet. As I mentioned earlier, the Hornet has incredible acceleration. However, the Talon has an incredible flight profile in atmosphere, and both the Hawk and the Talon can outrate the Hornet. When we're talking about rate, we're talking about how quickly a ship can turn, the turn rate. If the Hornet runs, the Hawk has a higher top speed than the Hornet and can catch up. At this point, all that's left is the Cutlass Blue, but unfortunately, the pilot is currently writing an angry post on Spectrum. CIG regularly talks about the fact that they want players making choices, and in our example, we were doing just that. What ships to bring, what weapons, what order to send in ships, what teams do we send in and against who? When a friend needs help, who do we send to support them? And this is one of the things that makes Star Citizen so great and why ship and weapon diversity is so good, although we're still waiting on that weapon rebalance CIG. No ship in Star Citizen is supposed to be an I win button. Yes, when you're flying an arrow and you don't have much experience, an F8C might seem like a nightmare, or when you're flying a Vanguard Harbinger, a car to all might seem like death itself. That's not to say you can't beat those ships. Star Citizen is a skill-based game. If you watch my stream, you'll regularly catch me dogfighting in an Aurora MR. But where some ships are designed to be strong against others, those same ships are also designed to be weak against others. That arrow, when thrown against an equally skilled pilot in, say, a Crusader Ares Ion, will decimate them. The Vanguard Harbinger with its size 5 torps would outfly and slaughter a constellation. Again, Star Citizen is a skill-based game, but what ship you fly and what ship you fight will either make the fight easier or harder. And let's not forget the environmental impact. Always think about space and atmosphere. No matter what I'm flying, I'll always try to avoid fighting an F8C in atmosphere, because F8C pilots are highly skilled professionals at flying backwards and sideways at 800 meters per second. Whenever I'm in my Aurora MR, I'll generally try to take the fight to space if it starts in atmosphere. But if I'm flying the arrow, it's the other way around, again depending on what I'm fighting. Next time you step out of your hab ready for a grand space adventure, I encourage you to think about the task ahead and what ship you think would be best for the task. I get that not everyone is a concierge or legatus with a fleet of ships and a pending divorce, but never be afraid to ask a friend or even in global chat to try out ships. I've been around this community for a long time and if I've learned anything it's that people are excited to share new experiences with others. If you have some examples of combat scenarios that you would like to share, feel free to do so in the comments below. If you've enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate if you'd hit that like button, and if you'd like to see more videos like this one in the future, or any of my daily YouTube shorts, hit that subscribe button. But for now, I've been Moist Noodle, and I'll shoot you in the verse.